Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Alan Sherman, and this is the meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab, uh, the first meeting of the fall. Uh, we'll be meeting here um, bi-weekly every two weeks, 12 to 1, with um, interesting research talks. Uh, today, it's our pleasure to have uh, UMBC alumnus Adam uh, Sackle, who has a really interesting job doing um, penetration testing and similar things, and he's here to tell us about um, uh, physical security. Uh, thank you so much, Adam, for joining us. It's my pleasure. And as we usually do, and and we will be posting the um, the recording on the CDL webpage and the U-Cyber website. All good to go? We're all good. Sounds good. Uh, well, as mentioned, I'm, a, I'm Adam Saxel, uh, UMBC alumni from 2020-21, I don't remember which year it was. Um, and today we'll be talking mainly about physical security um, and how I, maybe not we, uh, break it legally. Um, graduated from UMBC in 2021, uh, majored in computer science. I uh, did a little bit of IT work for UMBC for a while. Um, and then as I graduated, uh, RSM Consulting out here in uh, Des Moines, Iowa picked me up. <clears throat> and I came on full time as a cyber testing associate, um, which is weird because for some reason, nobody says penetration testing and I have no clue why. Um, generally, I was brought on to the uh, social engineering team for RSM. So that means that I go around the country and I uh, go to banks, uh, office buildings. We just had one at an airport. Technically, it was an office building in an airport. Um, and we attempt to uh, socially engineer our way into these buildings to bypass the physical security, which is why I'm kind of giving the talk on this. Outside of this, hobbies include running, biking, pretending I'm good at those two. Um, and then doing anything really associated to security or my job, um, slowly building up a personal lab in my apartment, if anybody has any tips for that. <laughs> so moving on to the actual talk, um, we'll be kind of covering, as I mentioned, physical security. Um, so that is anything from cameras to putting guards at the front, um, doing kind of a tabletop assessment of a uh, hypothetical power station and trying to see what you guys think would be a good idea for um, physical security for that. Um, I'm a very much back and forth kind of presenter, so uh, chime in if you have any questions or if you have any input. And then we'll move on to kind of what I do on a day to day um, assessing physical security. So going between site assessments and um, actual physical pen tests where we are posing as a criminal or a um, threat actor attempting to get in. Um, at the end, I'll kind of touch a little bit more on social engineering. It's not really the focus of the talk, but it's a huge part of what I do day to day. So we'll do a little brush over that and then maybe I can come back and give a talk on that whenever. We'll see. So disclosure as we start, I go over some things here that if you don't do it for a job, it's not OK to do. Um, so I don't endorse crime, do not commit crimes and never say my name but uh, don't commit crimes. So jumping into really what physical security is um, and how it relates to cybersecurity or InfoSec, um, physical security is the protections put in place in the physical world um, to prevent threat actors from getting access to confidential data or um, places that they shouldn't be allowed access to. Some people might see it and say that's not part of cybersecurity, but you can't really have secure or infosec security without physical security. If somebody just walks into your building and has access to your printers or your file cabinets that have sensitive information on them, there's no need to try and do an external pen test or get in externally um, to get to any of that data. So in my eyes, physical security is more important than a lot of the InfoSec protections put into place. Um, traditionally, security is kind of broken down, split where it's law enforcement and cameras and physical security, and then information technology, which is you know the focus of a lot of um, security classes. 
um, as we start with physical security or just security in general, uh, we have the CIA triad, not the CIA, the place, but separate thing where the most important things are confidentiality, where you're protecting the data, um, integrity to make sure that nobody has access to the data that shouldn't have access, and then availability where it should be easily accessible to those that are allowed to have access. One of the big things about accessibility is if it's really hard to access the data and you have to go through all these steps to access it, people are going to find ways to make it easier for themselves, which compromises physical security, which you kind of see in InfoSec as um, having those huge password requirements and having to change them every month, but then they get easier to guess because everybody's using like fall 2021. And then when we jump into physical security, um, as the CIA triad works in InfoSec as well, um, physical security, you have to add on a little bit to protect against these active assailants, um, give a way to um, alert law enforcement or security if deviant behavior is detected, and then um, kind of in the terms of availability, making the sites look aesthetically pleasing or not making it look like a prison if you're just in an office building. I don't think many people would say that physical physical security is not an important thing, um, but just in case there's one or two, there's a lot to lose when it comes to physical security uh, and dealing with assailants. Um, we have money, goods, like diamonds and vehicles, diamonds you see in um, the Antwerp diamond heist, which is my favorite example of a failure of physical security. A big thing in Belgium where people stole a ton of diamonds. Um, Vehicles, um, we've had times where I'll get into the back of a, a bank and they'll have all the keys for the fleet vehicles. Um, and then informational assets such as client personal data, social security numbers, um, ethernet ports to get into the internal network, things of that nature. So now that we know kind of what we have to lose and we got a general overview of physical security, um, I'm kind of going to do a little back and forth with you guys, a little tabletop exercise works better in person, but we make do. Um, so we'll have an example coming up here of a electrical, um, power station, um, that has security systems kind of implemented already to identify problems, um, with like the InfoSec side of it, uh, and monitoring problems with the power station itself, but no physical security problems ha or physical um, security has been implemented. Um, no full time staff, voltage switching gear, signals going wirelessly and physically. We'll skip this next slide. This actually works better virtually because this is terrible when it's projected. So generally here we have and I don't know much about electricity <laughs> or I don't know a lot about power stations and I don't know if you guys do. But um, we can kind of tell the important parts here are the reactor, transformers, um, and hopefully that communication and control equipment door, the control building. So just from this picture, does anybody want to jump in and say what kind of physical security we already have? Things that um, they've already put in place that are hopefully keeping people out of the building. Hmm? Yep, gate and hopefully locked door. Yep. I, I like the hopefully locked door because it's completely honest that a lot of the times some of these doors just won't be locked. Um, there's a big thing where uh, a lot of the outside doors will be locked on buildings. Um, and they expect that nobody will be, be able to get into the building because the outside is locked but they'll leave doors like to the server room or the control building completely unlocked because anybody that's in the building is supposed to be there. So that's all good. Firewalls, firewalls are also good. Um, another thing with physical security is damage. Um, so fires just in the building itself or from assailants are also a huge problem. All right, um, so that's pretty good. Uh, going on next, we'll just kind of ask, what do you guys think we should add? What do you think um, are kind of attack vectors, as you'd think when you're thinking more infosec wise, um, that we don't have any kind of protections against? Or 
as we said, things that um, would help with response to assailants or things like that. Anything at CCTV? Yeah, we don't see any kind of cameras. Barbed wire? Yep. Because that fence looks like it's probably pretty climbable. Key cards are big. It does, as you can, you can kind of see here at the bottom left, it kind of just looks like a padlocked gate. Yeah, it's all, it's all pretty good stuff. Alligators. Alligators would work. <laughs> um, and now we'll kind of look at the uh, NIST framework and see how it applies to that picture we just kind of went over, see what we covered. Um, identify. Uh, I identified the things that need protecting. I kind of didn't let you guys do that. Um, protect. Uh, we went over the, you already have the fences. Adding fences is good. Barbed wire, things of that nature. Um, detection, in my mind, was um, the CCTV that you mentioned. Great idea. Um, key cards are also kind of a form of that, as a lot of key card systems, um, if there is an incorrect key card or, you know, Somebody tries to swipe in that's not supposed to be there. A notification will be sent. Um, respond. We didn't really go over that, but this is more of when something is detected on CCTV or motion sensors, how um, how we will respond to that, whether it's an automated call to security on site or automated call to 911 or logging for that. Um, and then recovery. Recovery is one I didn't really go over that's kind of covered in physical security. And that is, how are we going to fix what's broken when inevitably somebody gets in? Because we all know if you're working in InfoSec, somebody's pretty much always going to find a way in, even if it takes years. Um, so having backup parts for the substation um, would be a great idea. When it comes to um, confidential uh, information leakage, there's a problem with that because you can't really undo the leaks. Um, but then there's a lot of things like replacing key cards or replacing fences, things of that nature to kind of recover from an assailant or threat actor. Um, so we're kind of going to focus on the different parts of detection and things that are used to prevent breaches in physical security. A lot of the things that we mentioned um, key cards, cameras, things like that. Um, first, focusing kind of on cameras, as it's it's a very common thing in in any building for physical security. Now, um, we go from things like CCTV, closed circuit TV that are kind of older, but um, <laughs> things like that. When we do internal penetration tests, um, because I kind of do both occasionally. Very rarely we'll get access to like an IP based camera system. Um, and we'll be able to sit here uh, as internal pen testers just watching the cameras in a building. So in my eyes, CCTV is a it's old, but it, it prevents against um, other kind of like cyber attacks and stuff like that. Um, I don't think I've seen a building in a while that has CCTV though. So see. Um, as I mentioned, IP based, so it's it's like the ring cameras almost, um, but things like that on a scale for companies or on a, a corporate scale. Um, and these are connected normally to the internal network, hopefully segmented off, um, but sometimes they're not. <clears throat> and network accessible, so they're normally like monitored from a, a central room or remotely. Um, bunch of different software. I couldn't tell you the first one, or I couldn't tell you a single software for CCTV stuff or for IP-based stuff. Um, I haven't gotten too much into it, but as I said, I've seen a few, um, plenty of options out there. And then just pan, tilt, zoom are just the movable cameras. So sometimes you'll see like the black balls on the ceiling and um, occasionally those aren't like 360 degree cameras. They're just pan, tilt, zoomable ones. So you can't see where they're looking which is a pretty great thing. Um, in my opinion, would I recommend CCTV or IP based? Uh, it's kind of a hard, I mean, CCTV is old. Um, I mean, if, if we look on the slide, I mentioned uh, like DVR or like old style CCTV. Um, I would probably recommend IP-based, 
uh, just because of the inter interconnectivity. Um, there's the threat of somebody getting in through the network and stuff like that, but there's obviously ways to prevent that. Um, obviously things like, um, um, oh, I'm blanking on the word. I, I'll just say segmenting the network. Um, so it's harder to kind of transition from like the employee network or um, things like that to like where the cameras are. Um, but again, uh, I'm not a full special to specialist on cameras and the monitoring equipment like that. So I'll say that. Um, as we mentioned for fences um, and key cards, kind of going back a step, we'll talk about locks and kind of ways I, that I've bypassed them that I will again say do not do unless you're, um, sorry, give me a sec. Unless you are practicing on like a practice lock that you get online or, um, you know, as a hobby doing something like lock picking. So we have things like um, padlocks, which are the ones that you see like right here, <clears throat> which are the traditional kind of style locks that you, you'd think of when somebody says the word lock. Um, not permanently attached, so when you key it or when you open it, you can take it off and put it wherever, um, which leaves room for people to, you know, open it and then misplace it or put it somewhere so it's unlocked. Um, since it's kind of an older style lock, obviously, even though it's still used, the easiest bypass, which I don't do because I would get in trouble for physical damages, um, are bolt cutters. Um, if you've practiced lock picking, you know, you can always do that too. Um, deadbolts, uh, which are these, which you'd see on like apartments, like older apartments or things like that, or, um, hotel rooms, um, weak frame is just, I mean, that's just brute forcing a door, but that again, we don't do that and it's not recommended. Um, or things like, uh, under the door tools, um, which I had an example of, but I didn't go into the office this week, so I didn't have a chance to grab it. And then the traditional knob handle lock, uh, which is always kind of um, vulnerable to things like lock picking or, again, under the door tool locks, kind of things like that. Um, <clears throat> we'll go into a little later, um, if anybody knows the coal fire incident, why the bypasses that I mentioned for the locks are things that we don't really do anymore. Um, I didn't mention door shimming and things like that. but um, there have been kind of movements in the field to move away from actually trying to break locks and and um, you know block cameras and things like that and pushing it toward more towards more of a social engineering approach, um, which is mainly what we do now. Uh, but I'll go into later how coal fire kind of affected that. <clears throat> so going into the the professional side of it and what um, sorry give me a sec. <laughs> What I kind of do professionally to test these things um, is what I like to call the two-pronged approach. Um, we'll have two, doesn't look bad if you break stuff. Yeah, it looks extremely bad if we break things on client site, which is terrible, haven't done it. Um, again, we'll mention it in, in the coal fire. Uh, two-pronged approach, um, we'll normally do two pass-bys of a client, um, depending on what they ask for or what they pay for. Sometimes they'll only ask for one or if it's um, somewhere like uh, I did a law firm and they didn't want a penetration test because there were clients and they didn't want us interacting with them or doing things like that. So we start off normally with a site assessment, which is the uh, more passive side of it, where you meet with the client, you go into the site um, and they will walk you around or you'll walk around on your own um, with you know one of their cards or something. And it's just an overview of where the cameras are, how many cameras they have, um, what kind of locks they have, different areas that they tell you are confidential and shouldn't be accessed by anybody, um, and what kind of protections they have on those areas. So for the law firm, when I went in, um, they had three floors, <clears throat> and um, they mentioned that nobody should ever be on the second floor unless they're an employee, and then each floor had a room of confidential documents from current clients and said that nobody should ever be in there except for the actual lawyers or um, some front desk people. 
But the problem with the file storage that they had, there was no protection. There weren't even locks on the doors. Um, and every time I passed by, the doors were open. So for a site assessment, I'm not going into those rooms and um, trying to get screenshots of confidential data for proof. Um, we'll just take pictures of the doors um, and then talk to the client afterwards and say, maybe you should put a you know lock on your important document storage. Um, some clients, again, they like this better because it 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 kind of scared not scares them, but it makes them uncomfortable to have somebody unknown walking around their building. Which is kind of the point, but that's an aside. Um, once we've done the site assessment, um, or if they didn't ask for a site assessment, we'll move on to the active testing of penetration test, where uh, the client will give us a day or two, sometimes three, where we are allowed to be on site and depending on what they detail in their um, letter of authorization, there are things we're allowed to do and things we're not allowed to do. Most of the time it is um, no damage to site, uh, during hours testing, no after hours testing, and focusing on attempting to convince employees that we are supposed to be there and sneak our way into um, confidential sites. This is the one that everybody, you know, is excited for because it's more of a criminal mindset. Um, you put yourself into the eyes of, of a, a threat actor to see, <laughs> sorry, to see how you would get through things um, physically. Um, as I said here, site assessments are um, the passive assessments, um, and we normally just get them for the big old check mark on annual assessments and um, things like PCI tests where you're worried about um, payment information or client or um, not client, customer payment information. So if credit cards or systems like that are being used. Um, and then a lot of hospitals will do this because they don't want you in. Oh, noise. One of the call in users. Um, the other one is HIPAA stuff, like I said, hospitals where um, they are worried about you being with clients or interrupting things that have to do with the healthcare. Um, so they don't want you, you know, breaking into the hospital. Um, I'm actually, yeah, so site assessments, we focus on just kind of the list of checking where the perimeter is, where we're not allowed to be, where we are allowed to be, doors and windows that are um, not physically secure, lighting, which is a strange one, but um, areas that you could easily get through because of poor lighting without anybody questioning you, cameras, as we mentioned, um, visitors is an interesting one. Uh, as it's focused on how the company or the client deals with visitors. Uh, so if they have just a sign-in sheet and then take a badge and you can get anywhere, bad security practices. If it's more um, walk up to the front desk and they'll escort you to where you need to be, it's kind of the way that we're focused and um, the way that we want people to kind of move towards. As it, it distracts the front desk person for a time, but it's a lot more secure. So Somebody can't just slip off and go wherever they want. Um, access control systems, we're focusing on things like key cards or um, man traps, which we'll show a little later, um, and things like that to prevent people from getting where they're not supposed to be. Um, alarm is more of the um, how we're going to alert alert the company if somebody gets in somewhere that they're not supposed to be. It's not just a simple, you know, they can't get in the door. If somebody tries to get in, we want logs or things like that to make sure that um, they are caught and put out of the building. Um, and then guard force and document control are kind of self-explanatory, but checking what kind of staff on site we have for response and making sure that documents like HIPAA documents or social security numbers are, are locked down and under control so nobody can just walk in and grab them. Site assessments are fun. So we'll do a little site assessment. Um, wow, it already showed all the squares and things. That was supposed to pop up as I went. <laughs> um, so I'll kind of go over it. This is um, 
a nuclear power plant of an unnamed name. Hopefully nobody knows what it is. Whatever. Um, so just taking this as a screenshot and going through my mindset of what I would do as a site assessment before I went in, I know that nuclear power plant main point of focus is here at the very end where the reactors and things are. <clears throat> um, as I can't get in there and see the kind of controls that they have, um, I'm focused more on what I can see from an aerial view. So here in this top left blue box, I'll jump in. And we can already see that there is a perimeter wall. We can't see what kind of perimeter wall. We can't see barbed wire or anything, but you can see the guard checkpoints. Um, and as you kind of go up further, you can kind of see little tower, maybe towers or gates that can get in, which are huge. Um, watching the, the edge of the compound is a huge focus. <clears throat> and then you can kind of see maybe this is like the power management and you can see a smaller wall here that blocks it off which is great it's almost like segmentation of a network when you're dealing with the infosec side of it um where it, it's a lot it, it's separate controls to make sure you're not getting into um further access um and you can kind of see maybe there's a border wall here <clears throat> but these are all things we do during a site assessment or right before a physical pen test, if we can get an aerial view to see if we can find any um, other ways in, along with like back road stuff, which is wonderful. <clears throat> but we'll move on from that. So after going over kind of um, passive recon and active stuff, yeah, you're fine. You didn't hear any of that. Don't get me arrested, Sean. <clears throat> Um, so again, just like we did with the power station, um, what do we see here that is good? What do we see that could prevent a physical attacker from just walking on into the back? I'll give it a sec because I don't know if there's a little back and forth. Lighting. Perfect. Extremely well lit. Nobody's going to just walk around the corner. Walls, yes. Strangely enough, walls are a very good um, security measure. Um, staffed, front desk, amazing. Cameras, yep, you can kind of see like just right behind, they have a single camera for every single um, clerk, which is great. Um, what I can see, at least from, yep, there you go. I was actually just about to call that out. Uh, alarm system right at the back. You can kind of see where ho it could be a thermostat, but I'm going to say that it's an alarm system. Um, and actually right next to it, you can see what I assume when I do this is a um, badge reader, um, which hopefully is great that the doors are badged. Um, <clears throat> and then the front desk. Front desks are highly obnoxious when you're doing a physical pen test. Uh, okay, now, moving from the good, um, what do we see that could possibly be bad here? Or things that you think we should add? <laughs> Strangely enough, uh, site assessments. I am not looking for things that I could throw. Yep. <clears throat> Doors um, to back offices, open door in the back. Yep, that's exactly one of the things I saw. Maybe we won't add barbed wire to the indoor. That would probably be not great. But I like the idea. Um, yeah, that, that is a huge one. Um, the fact that there's no real door here and it kind of looks like that's the back office on the left. And we don't, it, it's a good call security personnel. We don't see if there's any uh, security personnel as there's nobody in the picture right now. But if there's not, then there needs to be. So we'll move on in the interest of time, but yeah, that's all That's all pretty good um, observations. I'll throw one last one in there. Coffee machines at the front. People could just steal coffee. And that is a, that is a huge security flaw in my mind. <clears throat> so 
kind of going back to uh, our objectives for these passive assessments. Uh, we're taking time to check any security that is in place um, for any possible security vulnerabilities uh, and putting ourselves into the mind of a criminal while not performing the acts where we are attempting to determine how a threat actor would perform these malicious physical attacks and how we can move to prevent that. So we will normally provide a page or two of suggestions for each vulnerability that we find to remediate it. Um, and then we'll keep that if they're a repeat client and bring that back up to them to ask how they've remediated that since our last physical or since our last site assessment. Um, <clears throat> and kind of go from there. Again, please do not commit crime. Um, we're moving into kind of the actual physical pen test part where I do things that you should not be doing outside of uh, work or <clears throat> anything you're employed to do. So don't commit crime. So when we move into physical testing or physical pen testing, uh, we move away from the passive listing of vulnerabilities and move more into proving that it's a problem. A lot of clients, when you do site assessments, will say, no, that's not really a problem. We, you know, we haven't ever had anybody abuse that. Um, most of the time, their biggest thing is um, our employees will say something. Nobody's going to walk into that room. Somebody will say something and see it. Spoiler alert, nobody says anything ever. So when we do these physical pen tests or the actual active tests, we can take a picture of ourselves in that room. As you saw at the very beginning, I was in um, a client's uh, break room, which isn't really too bad. Uh, just taking like pizza out because there was a party going. Uh, but it, it's a lot more, e it's a lot easier to prove to the client that there's a problem when you abuse it and you're in like, their server room. So we'll normally start these these assessment or these tests by setting goals with the client. So a lot of the time the goals are um, get somewhere where you're not supposed to, which is very broad, but they'll give you a list of you shouldn't be able to get into our server room. Um, you shouldn't even be able to get past the front desk. And we'll put that as a goal and we'll focus our efforts on doing those specific things. And then we'll move on to um, seeing how much we can do before getting called out by employees. Uh, sometimes that escalates to the point where um, I've stood on top of desks that have people at them so that I can get access to the wireless um, access points on the ceiling. Um, but you're just trying to see if the company is aware of possible threat actors, which a lot of them they aren't. Um, and then we will detail out the rules of engagement, which are the uh, letter of authorizations that we draft so that we don't get arrested. Um, and it is everything that the client is allowing us to do and things that they do not want done on their site during the test. Um, a lot of these will say no physical damage to the site or um, only during hours testing. Uh, if you don't have one of these or you break that, um, we'll move into coal fire, like I mentioned earlier, which is why letter of authorizations are so important. <clears throat> so, coal fire, um, as we all kind of call it, that's the name of the company. Um, it happened in September 2019, right before your COVID happened, or right before the shutdowns happened for COVID. Um, COVID is a security consulting company just like mine in the state of Iowa or the engagement was in the state of Iowa. And this happened at a um, state courthouse. So the physical pen test was scoped for um, county courthouses, several of them around the state. Uh, pretty straightforward, get in uh, after hours testing <clears throat> with two testers, Justin Wynn and Gary Demercio. Demercio? I'm not good at names. And they had gotten into several of the state courthouses before this happened successfully. Um, moving on to the county courthouse in Dallas County, uh, which happened to actually technically be a state courthouse or something like that. Um, 
they were doing after hours testing. They had gotten into a door that was unlatched and the alarm wasn't triggered. So just to test, as we do, they shut the door and then opened it again to trigger an alarm in order to provoke a response to see response times. After this, um, the county sheriffs showed up um, and arrested the two for trespassing. Um, they were sent to jail for a bit. Uh, eventually, the state police let them go um, after uh, the judge had raised bail by 10% the normal amount, or 10 times the, the normal amount. Uh, because she had physically feared for her life because she didn't know these people. The letter of authorization wasn't correct, um, and apparently they were at the wrong site. So after this, uh, a lot of methodologies have changed for physical penetration testing. Back before this, a lot of tests used to be after hours, um, in person, doing things like badge replication, lock picking, door shimming, under the door tools, like I mentioned, um, <clears throat> jumping fences, getting into like security doors at like midnight. After this, um, a lot of things changed. No more after hours testing, um, no more jumping fences, no more lock picking, no more under the door tools because it's more criminal. Um, <clears throat> and companies like uh, RSM, the one I work at and coal fire don't want to deal with legal pre repercussions if testers get arrested. Um, so letter. Yeah, exactly. Don't do crime. Crime does not pay and nobody wants to go to jail because you're doing your job. So nowadays it's very focused on social engineering and doing network or doing testing during hours. As for goals, as we went over with assessments, it's it's kind of the same idea, but with more of an active asset or a active set focus. Um, physically get somewhere, physically do something you're not supposed to. This could be anything from getting into the server room to getting to a meeting room and just plugging your laptop into an ethernet port and then getting onto the internal network. Um, as I said with logical, I actually kind of skipped there. Um, logical is getting into network access and getting access to like the internal domain. Um, we'll just take screenshots of showing that we somehow got our um, computer added to the internal domain. Um, and then social things such as convincing the front desk or convincing the alarm that you're supposed to be there when you're really not supposed to be there, which as I mentioned earlier is definitely the best way to do it because the weakest aspect of security will always be people because you can't patch out trust. I should put that as a slogan. Teamwork makes a dream work. Um, I'm currently advocating at my company to make sure that physical pen tests are always done as two man teams. Um, because one of the issues when you get burnt uh, at like the front desk is you're done. Um, you can look for back doors or people propping them open, but you can't just try again at the front desk because they know you. <clears throat> so when you have these two man teams, it gives you at least two attempts to get in the front or um, if so the second one does get in the front, they can go open a door in the back. Exactly. Um, save reload. Uh, I have, uh, when I started, I did a six hour drive for a physical pen test on a bank. I walked into the front door um, and attempted to tailgate by sneaking, like getting into a group coming back from lunch <clears throat> and then getting through a, a card door. Um, earlier that week, I had gotten burnt at a different uh, bank branch for them um, by swiping a card that was no longer valid that I had found on a desk. And then I got caught at this branch immediately because apparently one of the people in the group was the person that had detected my earlier incorrect swipe at the other branch um, and immediately turned around and said, I don't recognize you. Could you show me your badge? I didn't have a badge. So I went back to my car to get it, came back in and he was just waiting there um, and eventually was like, hey, I know you're not supposed to be here, you can leave. So you drove six hours and then you get kicked out and you're done with your test. So I'm advocating for two man teams, which helps with that and then helps with um, oversight and information so you can have one person kind of 
observing as you attempt to social engineer and then giving kind of details that you missed because you're all hopped up on adrenaline lying to people. Um, so after getting past goals and things like that, um, we'll kind of get more into uh, weaknesses and what I'm looking for when I'm on these tests. Um, I haven't ever dumpster dove before, but some of my coworkers have where you go into the dumpsters or trash cans behind the building where some people would throw out documents um, just to see if you can find a confidential document or something that they've thrown out incorrectly or just dumped. Um, I think a few people have found compromises like that, found documents that should have been shredded in the in the trash. Um, and this counts when you get in and you're looking in the trash in the building. I will say it is probably the least fun and least um, effective way to get any information. Um, second will be stairwells. So um, some some office buildings will have it so that the stairwells are locked from the, the stairwell side of it. So you can't get in to a floor, um, obviously, by just walking up the stairwell. Um, or stairwells that are marked for one direction so that they're meant to only go down. But then you decide to kind of go the opposite way to see if somebody has propped the door open, um, which has become a lot more uh, prevalent since COVID started. And there's been a lot of remote workers because there's not a lot of people in the office. And uh, it's a lot harder to call somebody if you've like forgotten your badge or you left on your desk. So people have propped open doors a lot more when they're supposed to be one way or locked. Um, and this kind of goes for back doors into buildings as well. Um, we include wireless here, kind of because a lot of the time we do wireless tests like Wi-Fi tests um, at the same time as physical assessments, just because it's easy. So we will attempt to break private keys, um, try and get on the guest network and see if we can get onto the corporate network. Um, it's a lot less focused on physical, but we do it. So I thought I'd just throw it in there as a little thing to mention. Um, tailgating, I kind of mentioned that earlier as how I got caught, but tailgating is another one of the big ways we get through. Uh, when you're walking towards a door and there's a person behind you, right behind you, it's not really polite to just kind of walk in or even turn around and pull the door closed before they get there. I don't think I've ever done that. Um, and I hope, well, I wouldn't hope nobody does it, but probably doesn't happen. Normally, it's a lot easier to, you know, hold the door open to be a polite person. Tailgating is when you are that person coming and you just, oh, yeah, hold the door for me. I got my badge right here, which is just a fake badge. Um, there's many different ways to do it. Uh, the normal tailgate is just slip in after an employee. Um, double tailgate is the two attackers because it looks like you're really supposed to be there when you have a group as um, it was mentioned in the chat. The Marine Corps said two person integrity. Don't do it without a battle buddy. Um, yeah, it, it definitely is a little more convincing with two people. Uh, the false tailgate, which I've done once successfully, which is um, two people walking at the door um, and then both of you swiping your card and being like, oh, it's not working. The thing must be broken because both of us, our cards aren't working and a guard letting you through. And then the thing you see in movies um, that I've never done, uh, but misdirection where one creates a disturbance on the other side or somewhere by the door and then the other person slips in when nobody's looking um, this all kind of couples with lack of security awareness uh, it's not polite to not hold the door for somebody but securely it's it's the thing you need to do um, because employees won't really look at fake badges if it looks like their badge they'll just assume it's broken and then a lot of time there's not like a policy for reporting somebody slipping in behind you as it's kind of a strange thing to report. <clears throat> um, and then a lot of the time when you actually get in, uh, there's no clean desk policy, which uh, I we have at our company, which is to not leave any kind of confidential documents out. Don't leave keys, don't leave um, key cards out on your desk, making sure it's clean and that your laptop's like locked. This kind of a policy would stop a lot of attempts once we finally get in because a lot of people trust 
coworkers when you get into a building. Um, but you just have to assume that it's not going to be a coworker walking by. And then, as I mentioned, gaps in doors or prop doors. Um, just having uh, like the trash can in the door is a big problem, um, especially if it's a, a card door. Uh, even if it's just somebody going out because the bathroom's on the other side of it and they don't want to grab their key. That's a huge problem that we've had when we do physical tests. Um, just examples. I like this left one because it's apparently a camera system that is designed to uh, prevent tailgating. So it recognizes somebody swipes in and highlights them. And then if somebody comes in behind them and they didn't swipe, then it counts um, them as tailgating, which is really cool. And I mean to do more research on it. Now for problems for me, and we'll kind of, I know this ends at one correct. So I ten, okay. Problems for me that stop me from doing my job and things that are good for physical security. First off, or the first two kind of go together, which are man traps and RFID turnstiles, both ways to prevent entry into a building. Um, man traps being the worst, these are the, um, they're kind of like gates where you go into them and then you swipe and it lets you through or it lets you out. Um, so I've only run into one and it completely stopped any attempts getting through the front door. Um, the problem is that there was a second door next to the man trap. Um, that made it a lot easier for us to get through. Um, and then RFID turnstiles are kind of the things you see on the subway where you swipe your card and it opens up. Both of these are wonderful. Um, nobody's going to let you tailgate into a man trap. Um, I mean, I, I had a single coworker who squeezed in with somebody somehow. I don't remember the story of how he got through, but generally man traps are one of the best ways to stop entry from the front. Um, and then third, the social aspect, which is the aware front desk. Um, if you have somebody at the front desk who is sec security unaware um, and allows anybody through or is easy to convince, um, it kind of kills all security, the human aspect. So if you have an aware front desk, it's a huge problem. Nobody's going to get through if they're aware of who's coming to the building and who works there. Examples of man traps, kind of low res. The left one, I don't think I'd ever be able to get through. Um, the right one, maybe tailgating is possible, but it's it's rough. So kind of we're kind of pushing through this as quick as we can, and I don't really touch on social engineering a ton here because the focus was physical engineering or physical security. But a lot of the things we do and the ways we get through after coal fire are all social engineering, whether it's um, vishing, so calling up the front desk and telling them we're supposed to be there, or just talking to the person at the front desk and trying to get through. So we have a little kind of crash course um, that goes over the general ideas of what we do for social engineering for physicals. Uh, the first thing we kind of touch on is framing, which is all about how the person sees the world or how um, they see a situation that they are in and every kind of stimuli that would, or stimulus that would affect their view of it. Um, framing is always influenced by external stimuli or stimulus. Um, and we kind of want to be that, that stimulus on the outside, lots of stimulus. Um, changing their frame and making them, in our case, uh, assume that we're supposed to be there and we're supposed to be in places. Pretexting is kind of the prepping for framing. So setting up a story in your mind of who you're supposed to be or um, calling and setting up this pretext for them to say, hey, there's an electrician supposed to be coming in, let them through, things like that. Um, and a big thing with pretexting that I didn't think would be true until I started was it's very much has to be spontaneous. Planning out way too much just gets complicated and it runs your adrenaline up. Um, but when you're doing social engineering, it's very much spur of the moment, take any kind of opportunity you have. Um, I'm kind of, uh, we'll go over framing rules. We have enough time. So the rules of framing all kind of boil down to the first one, actually. 
um, which is anything that happens or you say or you do, how your pose looks, changes or evokes a frame or changes somebody's frame of view. Um, that's anything from how you dress to how your hair looks um, to how your greeting starts. Um, and, and it kind of defines how the person sees the situation you're in. So attempting to push a frame of dressing nice, getting your hair very nice, um, speaking very uh, pronunciated and acting like you're supposed to be there is very good for changing their frame to something you want. Um, rule three is very fun. Negating the frame does not work. So if somebody assumes that you are uh, a criminal and you're not supposed to be there, saying, I'm not a criminal, I'm supposed to be here, is not going to have the intended effect. Uh, so on the next slide, we talk about a lot of framing techniques, which are ways to change the frame without saying no to the frame or negating it. Um, and then rule four, mentioning the frame, makes the target think about a frame. So if you say, oh, uh, yeah, wouldn't it be weird if I was a criminal trying to get in here? The first thing they're going to think, obviously, is maybe he's not supposed to be here. Um, framing techniques, it, these are very, um, in the moment, you don't think, oh, I need to use transformation. But these are all kind of ways that we we take the frame that the person at the front desk is thinking, and we either change it or we adapt our pretext or our social interaction to change that frame. Um, bridging being um, trying to take the way that they are thinking about who you are. So if you walk in, they don't recognize you and they think you're not supposed to be here. Uh, bridging is a very, the, the easiest way that we get past it is saying, oh, I know I'm not supposed to be here today, but my boss said that your boss called and he needs to get this done before the quarter's over. So that's taking the idea um, that they have in their head and kind of not really rationalizing it, but connecting it to what the goal that you want, which is getting in past the physical security. Um, amplification is kind of on the same, the same note as it. It's a little more... Um, a little harder to execute, um, but it, it really is in the same vein as I'm not supposed to be here. You know, my apologies. Um, I was supposed to come later or earlier today. Um, not supposed to be here, but could you please let me in or my boss is going to get, you know, angry. Um, we're kind of going to skip over extensions because it's a little niche and a little... Um, hard to uh, I haven't really perfected it um, but then transformations uh, going into that is very much the idea of 80% lean equals 20% fat on ground beef and things like that where uh, you say kind of the same thing that they are thinking um, but put it in a different lens so that it doesn't seem as bad um, so uh, saying yeah I'm not supposed to be in this room but it would make it would make my job easier if I could just come in here, do this thing, and then, you know, you watch me the whole time. Um, and then they feel comfortable watching you as you plug your Ethernet cable in. Kind of going to, we'll just really quickly touch on pretexting to wrap it up. Um, but as I said, it's kind of practicing your story beforehand or setting up the story. Um, Local dialects and expressions are less used than I've, I thought they would be, um, especially if you're doing a lot of physical tests in the same kind of general area. So you don't have to like, you know, we have one in Scotland later um, and one of our guys has to learn how to do a Scottish accent, which is very strange, uh, but it is part of pretexting and making them believe that you're supposed to be there. Uh, definitely making sure it's simple um, keeping it spontaneous so that if something happens, you can modify it without making the person uncomfortable. Um, and then other things that could easily influence somebody. As I said earlier, um, my boss called your boss and, you know, we have to get this done, influencing them with an authority figure um, or, you know, saying that there's this thing that needs to get done. So I have to do this today or else I'm going to get in trouble and you're going to get in trouble and nobody wants that. Um, but that's all kind of lumped into pretexting and social engineering. 
Uh, I could do a whole day talking about social engineering. <laughs> um, sense of urgency seems to underpin a large portion of social manipulation strategies. Yes. Uh, actually, a huge thing about it is urgency. Nobody wants to get in trouble. Um, and if, you, if they have time and there's no urgency, then they can do all the checks that they're supposed to do, which is important for physical security to have checks where you message somebody on Teams to see if the, you know this is true. But if it's urgent and you say you have to move on to something else, they have to kind of either decide that they're going to stand in your way, which nobody wants to do, or that they're just going to let you through and then let you go, um, which is what we aim for. So kind of wrapping up, hoping I touched on everything um, that seemed interesting. Uh, we'll go on to training for this kind of thing if you guys want to get into this. Um, uh, I'll get to that question in a sec. Social engineering pen testing professional um, is the one mm, that didn't age well. Uh, that was the cert that my boss got um, as he trained the rest of us. I don't know if it's still going on. Um, I'd have to look into it. Uh, but contact me if you're interested about that because uh, there are some alternatives that uh, I've been looking at that I still have to update this with. Um, the ASIS, ANSI, uh, which is, there's some trainings, there's some certifications on there, um, but it's kind of like the authority for physical security stuff. Uh, Lock Sports is a great place to learn lock picking. Um, I believe they have their own, um, they have their own store for things like that. I would also recommend um, watching lock picking lawyer on YouTube because it's a very fun hobby, even if you don't use it in real life because it's a crime. Um, I have my little lock picking multi tool here, which is wonderful that I got at DEF CON. Um, and then OSINTframework.com, which is all about open source intelligence research. Uh, which is very helpful in physical pen testing um, and external pen testing and network pen testing. Uh, we actually have a whole team just devoted for open source um, at RSM, which is a very fun team. And if you have any questions about any of these, bug me after. Q&A. Oh. Uh, I see one from Zachary. Are those hooks that grab door handles from the other side under the door frame allowed? Oh, okay. Um, under the door tools, I kind of mentioned. Uh, I, we have one from for coal fire, but I don't think it's we really allow that anymore. And another thing with lock picking and under the door tools and door shims, technically, it's not banned, and it's not. <laughs> sorry in the letter of authorizations. But if you think about it, when you're lying to somebody and you get caught, you can kind of shimmy your way out of it. If you're caught lock picking a door or with an under the door tool, um, it's a lot harder to be like, I'm supposed to be here just checking the locks. Um, what persuaded me? Oh, actually, um, so, uh, I joined the UMBC Cyber Dogs my last year of computer science. I was going to be a software dev. Um, and I was put as a backup for the NCCDC, the Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition. Um, and somebody didn't show up. Yeah, that. So I got to go to the regional one. We won, and then I went to the nationals. And I kind of fell in love with... Um, pen testing and security in general. So I reached out to RSM and said, I know nothing about security. Could you please give me a shot and I'll get as many certifications as you want? Um, and they said, sure. So I jumped on as a network pen tester and they realized that I was one of the few testers that liked talking to people, um, which goes really well on social engineering team. Um, what do I wish I knew prior? Um, I wish I knew social engineering was a thing that you could do as a job. <laughs> um, it, it's kind of a niche job line, and I don't think you could technically do it standalone. You'd be a pen tester as well. Um, I wish I knew how easy it was to find certifications to take. Um, 
and also wish I knew that experience kind of dwarfs anything else like certifications. Everybody wants to know experience and not certs. So once you get a good job, certs are wonderful, but doing things on your own time um, and practicing on like a personal lab is so much bigger than, I don't know. I mean, Network Plus is, and Security Plus and stuff, they're all good, but if somebody sees on your resume that you have a personal lab set up and you've tested all these exploits or you have CVEs, that's so much bigger. Um, cut me off if we don't have a lot of time, but <laughs> I'll keep answering till then. Uh, free time. So I don't really have a lab yet. It's all set up in just VMs on my desktop, which is terrible. Um, especially because I don't have a lot of RAM. Uh, but it's a lot of like when a new big exploit comes out, um, trying to figure out the setup to uh, get it onto my lab and then, um, attempting to exploit it. Um, I'm currently practicing for, and I didn't put it in there because it's not physical, uh, the PNPT, Practical Network Penetration Tester, which is, in my opinion, first off, the cheapest, and second off, the most practical if you want to get into pen testing. Um, things like, and I'll never, I think OSCP is a great certification, but it doesn't show a lot of the new tools and things that we actually do on tests. It's very good at, um, showing the underlying why you do what you do, but a lot of the stuff is packaged into tools and things um, that it doesn't mention. So I'm currently practicing for that so that I can actually have a certification under my belt. Uh, yeah. Yes, Security Plus, Network Plus, PNPT, OSCP. I would say PNPT is the best, but OSCP is also wonderful, so it's, it's just hard. <laughs> If you want to get OACP, do it before you get a full-time job because it takes a lot of time. Cool. Um, is there anyone on profession you look to? That's a hard one. Um, TCM, the cyber mentor who does PNPT, is pretty great because he puts a lot of stuff out for free. Uh, IPSEC, IPP, SEC on YouTube does all the hack the box um, boxes, and does walkthroughs and write-ups of those. He's great. Um, and then there's a ton of people on Twitter. I will say if you're getting into InfoSec, uh, that's another thing I wish I knew. For some reason, everything in InfoSec is on Twitter, and I could not tell you why. Um, I don't follow too many physical security guys anymore. Uh, I should but um, I couldn't give you any names. Well, thank you very much, Adam. Um, and we'll be ba back here in two weeks for the next talk. Um, if anybody has anything that they want to bug me about afterwards, um, I'll put my email in here. Boom, it's just my first name, last name at gmail.com because I got lucky and got that. <laughs> um, reach out. I love, um, you know, doing just quick calls with people to try and get them into the industry um, and things like of that nature. I um, emailed you two papers that we wrote here at UMBC that may interest you. Um, one was uh, a phishing attack against the UMBC community, and another one was a uh, um, SFS study project um, in which we um, analyze part of the UOBC network. Oh, I love fishing. Fishing is wonderful. Uh, my company actually just sent out a fish like last week. It's the best one ever, and it's got the highest click rate because it's just a giant red button. There's nothing else in it, and we all thought it was a joke. Um, two of us, including myself, were like, I know it's fishing, but I'm going to click it anyway because it's hard to resist. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Bye. This concludes our session. Um, if I 